Hi folks, welcome to another Architect Tomorrow video. Um, I'm really excited about this one actually. This was a conversation I recorded with Penny, Matt and John about the hybrid workforce and the, the changes and the things we need to plan for and think about. Somewhat ironically, given we were talking about things like Zoom and Teams, I unfortunately hit the wrong record option when I was, uh, was doing the Zoom call. So instead of the usual format where we have you know, multiple people on the screen at once and you can see everyone at, you know, at the same time, unfortunately it's largely going to be single person view at the time. So um, apologies for that. I don't think it takes away from what is a brilliant conversation though about the hybrid workforce, about the people, process and technology changes that we all see coming and, and the adaptation that we all need to kind of go through. So look, enjoy. Um, if you enjoy it, please do hit subscribe. Please do let me know your feedback, put some comments in here, reach out to me. And if you want to get involved in one of these, um, please do let me know. Anyway, enjoy. How do organisations and particularly how do technology architects and technology strategists think about the differences, the changes in what is now becoming kind of known as hybrid working? You know, clearly, the pandemic has accelerated a number of trends. Uh, it, it's accelerated remote work. It's, it's accelerated the adoption of cloud and various other things. But I think it's time to take sort of stock of what all this means, really, and, and, and where is there some forward planning required? But to kick this all off, um, Let's, let's do some brief intros. So myself, just quickly, I'm Oliver Cronk. Those of you who watch Architect Tomorrow episodes on a regular basis will, will, will know I, I run Architect Tomorrow. Um, I'm also the chief IT architect for a company called Tanium, uh, a cover the European region. Pleased to say today, I'm joined by John, Matt and Penny. And perhaps if we can kick off with you, John, uh, give us a bit of background on yourself. Thanks, Oliver. Um, pleased to be here. The short version of my background is 20 odd years as a management consultant. I've worked in organizations such as Royal Bank of Scotland, Tesco Bank, uh, Rio Tinto, and we know each other from our days at Three. Uh, recently just uh, established a consulting organization with Matt, uh, Airmood Consulting, and really our focus at the moment is how to help people create, create good balance in their day-to-day -day life and good balance whenever they're finding themselves having to work at home and then maybe work in an office, and how do they transition from place to place. So. My, my career, yeah, very much management consulting, uh, leadership development, employee engagement, culture change, all of the above. Thanks, John. Perhaps we can go to you next, Matt. My career generally over the last 20 odd years has been in the voluntary or community sector. Um, but uh, for the last couple of years, particularly, I've had the opportunity to work a little bit freelance and actually pick up kind of uh, the primary parenting role as we kind of transitioned kind of into and through 2020. That was something that kind of I was juggling. I discovered I'm really bad at homeschooling, as John's mentioned. Um, kind of particularly in the last few months, we've been kind of leaning into uh, what it might mean to kind of help individuals and businesses think through uh, just this work shift uh, thing that we're uh, kind of, I think, still um, in a place of working our way through and trying to see uh, how do we configure this so that it works best for uh, kind of everybody involved. Thanks, Matt. And, and Penny, over to you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Penny. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at an IT consultancy called Presido. We're a boutique firm specialising in Salesforce.com implementations. Um, and I am the classic accidental IT person. I was in financial services, but also kind of had an academic legal career running in parallel. Um, and uh, had my first small consultancy business, probably getting on for 25 years ago, um, went straight back to work after having my baby, but then sold the company when she was nearly two and took 18 months off. And then coming back to the workforce after that meant I really had to start over again um, and got a job uh, working at the Carbon Trust, which is where I initially worked with Oliver. Um, and fell into doing Salesforce by accident. Um, now my daughter is about to turn 18 and I'm now um, a Salesforce IT professional. Thanks, Penny, that's great. And so look, John, let's kick things off by talking about your report because that's the whole reason we, we're all on this call actually is the report that you put out by Ahmed, which I just found fascinating. So, you know, there were a number of things that stood out to me around kind of people's, you know, um, attitudes towards, you know, working remotely and working in the office. But what are the kind of highlights from the report that you would you would call out? Some obvious stuff around um, people's experience working from home in the in the positive and the negative camp. The big takeaway for 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 our work was people's 
acceptance that homeworking uh, is kind of here to stay. Uh, it's here to stay for, we think, a few different reasons. Um, one, from, a, from an employer's perspective, and maybe we'll, we'll come on to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, I think this is the first time employers have really put to test the technology that they have in place. Um, you know, so <clears throat> organizations, certainly a lot of people that we spoke to in our um, in our research, for the first time were finding themselves actually using this thing called Teams or Zoom or Google Hangouts, whatever it happened to be. The <laughs> thing the guys in the IT department have been pushing for years, all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, that's really quite useful. Um, so organizations have find an opportunity to maximize a bunch of technology or infrastructure that's kind of just been lying dormant for ages. And they've now gone, if we use that to good effect, actually we can work pretty effectively. Organizations that are in that context are then going, hmm, maybe we can save some costs associated with this. So there's a bunch of organizational drivers, but from, uh, from an employee's perspective on like a bunch of personal um, levels, you know, big benefits for people around flexibility, around commute um, or, or lack of commute, more time with the family. So if I'm a, an employee looking into this thing, uh, I'm going, actually, yeah, okay, my first my first few months of the pandemic might have been pretty ropey as we kind of all just got our heads around it. But now, a year in, um, we're finding that approximately 82% of people that participated in our survey expect to work from home at least two days a week. Once also take once all social distancing is gone, mm -hmm. eighty percent plus people expect to work from home two days a week. Fifty percent expect to work three days a week or for more, and about thirty percent just all just permanent. Even in our research, because we when we first came across that, we thought, oh, have the people that participated in our survey, are they just people who like working at home? And therefore, are they going to be um, positive to this thing? Of course. Well, even when you look at the people who participated in our survey and said, I don't like this thing. I don't like working at home. I hate it. More than half of them expect to be working three days a week or more at home anyway. So for people who love it and for people who hate it, um, there's a general recognition that it's pretty much going to be here to stay yeah there's a, there's a couple of things that I'd, I'd love to unpick as a group one one is uh, which we'll come on to in a second is has it been great for everyone because I think there's perhaps different sides to to that I mean uh, I think um for those of us that were perhaps doing long commutes and had strenuous kind of work travel um things going on uh yeah that was that was that was clearly um a benefit not having to travel so much but the other thing I'd really like to kind of talk about is this almost concept of days in the office versus, you know, um, working from home. I think there's been a lot of pushback. I've certainly seen on, on places like LinkedIn saying, is it about two days in the office, two days in, in, in uh, you know, working from home, or actually is it just about being in the right place at the right time? What, what, what's your sort of take on, you know, will organizations kind of have a policy that says we expect you to be in the office at least once a week? Or what, what, what are you kind of seeing out there as a response to all this? I think definitely some organizations will want to put a policy in place that says, this is exactly how it's going to look. I think those organizations are going to struggle. I think the organizations that will get this right will be full of managers who understand what's the right mix for their team. It sounds a little bit woolly. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're seeing in our research has been, uh, we've always known the role of the line manager is really important. That's kind of been given in the management consulting world for the last 20 odd years, 30 years. But what we've seen is um, an uptick in the EQ nature of good line management. So being able to tap into those moments when I might need to have a different conversation with Penny and a different conversation with Matt and a different conversation with Oliver because I understand that their circumstances are different and therefore I might need to treat them differently. Um, and I can use my knowledge of them and yeah, my emotional intelligence to understand how to get the best from them. So I don't think the organizations that are gonna do really well on this will say, our policy starts at end that 
we're going to have hybrid working environment and it's going to be as and when is needed and we're going to kind of leave that to the discretion of you know line managers team managers unit managers yeah. as opposed to right well on a tuesday you have to come into the office and on a thursday you can work from home that's not I don't see that being the world that will be successful. I'm not saying some organizations won't go down that route. We've already seen at, at the other extreme, we see some organizations saying, no, we want to have everybody back in the office. It's the difference in my mind between management, perhaps micromanagement, if you go to the extreme end, versus leadership, right? If you kind of instill yeah. the right kind of culture and the right sort of behaviors and you you model those from, you know, from, from all places, not just the top, but you know, all, all the way through the organization, then generally, my in my experience, I've worked in. I think I was I lost count the other day when I was working out how many organisations I've worked for in my twenty sort of plus year career. Um, you know, it's it's well into double digits. So you know, I've seen lots of different places, and I think the places that work best are where you kind of clearly instill a degree of trust and uh, you know and, and have sort of leadership. Penny, I know you had um, you, you you've got, perhaps got a different perspective on this one because I think you know, there's a lot of people sort of saying this is just full of positives for the employee. But I guess that's not always the case. I mean, would you would you kind of offer a different perspective on that one? I think there are a mixture of things, Oliver. So the description that you gave of being in the best place to do the work that's in front of you is probably the experience that I had even before Corona was a twinkle mm-hmm. in anybody's eye. And and it's probably pretty common in consultancies. I, I think, John, one of the challenges that maybe you didn't Um, talk talk about just then was what I'm seeing with a lot of our customers where they're downsizing their offices so they don't want to put in that kind of regime of you must be in on Tuesday you must be in on Thursday but they actually are going to have the bums on seats constraint (laughs) that means that they are going to have to put in some kind of directions about who's where and I think that might be one of the consequences that we see maybe going into next year is about what's going to happen to office space and exciting architecture and, and that whole area, because a lot of our customers are either giving up their offices completely or many of them shrinking down. So they might have a floor for 200 people and they're going to go down to um, a, a 50 person office in a shared building. Um, and that's going to requires some really different ways of working from people um, so I think that that's definitely going to be a big change. I totally agree the practical side of what I was talking about will need to have some form of even just kind of like scheduling if you've got let's imagine you had 100 people or desk for 100 people you've now got desks for 25 people <laughs> like how are you going to make that all work my thought process is that with the right technology to enable that, it can be a fluid process as opposed to a, our policy says everybody's going to be in the office or 50% of our people are going to be in office on a Monday. And it's then, a draconian, something sort of yeah, works. Kind of, you know, managing it because the policy says this is what I must do. Mm. It's going to be a combination of really insightful managers understanding their people and then when they try to operationalize where they bring their people, well, yeah, and then there's there's always going to be the how on earth do you get the people in the right spot and how you schedule that. And that's where people with you know big brains like yours and Oliver's can quite figure that out because I wouldn't be able to figure it out. <laughs> there's been desk booking systems for some time, but I think a lot of people have just sort of ignored them because perhaps there's been an abundance of desks, so they've not they've not had to worry so much. But um yeah, and, and perhaps perhaps there will be an evolution in some of that sort of office management um, sort of uh, side of things. But the, the other question this sort of leads to as well is the role of the office, right? I mean, we won't talk too much about this, but, you know, for me, I think I see the office kind of moving from just that place that everyone sort of clocks in and clocks out into, into the place where people connect or collaborate. Because clearly, I mean, there's a bit of debate here to be had, of course, about how much you can collaborate and kind of innovate and things online. But I, I would certainly say it's it's harder to kind of, bounce ideas off people now you 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 are often operating this very regimented scheduled day now where you you have meetings with people that you've pre-advanced you know um arranged the serendipity has kind of disappeared in a lot of cases or or vastly reduced you know it's quite novel actually now just to receive a normal phone call you know i quite like that actually i don't know what you guys think but i just say well thanks for ringing me because it's nice to not have to do the whole the whole video thing and sort of you know but um 
what's your take, Matt, on, on the sort of role of the office and, and the sort of location strategy for organisations moving forward? Have you got sort of strong opinions on that? As you've uh, headlined, kind of we're in this place where people are making choices as to kind of how are we going to start to kind of shape things or even, are we even open to thinking in new ways? Um, John and I were in a conversation recently with uh, an old colleague of John's who is doing some work with NetWest. And so they're talking about this juxtaposition from workplace to workshop along, along the lines that you're talking about there. And so I think some kind of businesses or organizations are stuck in a workplace mindset. Mm. Uh, and so certainly the stuff that's emerging in the kind of uh, learning that we've been doing uh, in our research is this kind of spectrum of preference, kind of where, where do you want to do your work? And, and is there a freedom to choose? And there may or there may not be depending on your, your employer or your circumstances. But if you can work in your pl place of preference and deliver on the tasks, essentially perform in the way that it, you're expected to, that would seem to be a win-win for everybody. Um, but I think the, the leadership management piece is going to be kind of hugely influential in terms of shaping uh, what is possible, I think, for individuals and the organizations that, that they work for. And I think ultimately, that will kind of impact longer term success. Certainly some of the conversational stuff that came out from our initial interviews or scoping in converse conversations uh, earlier on this year was that um, people younger than me are thinking, well, do I want to work for a company if they're going to kind of put in place particular restrictions about uh, work location, for instance, or questions about what are the uh, rewards or benefits working for a company when I used to get kind of gym membership or other stuff if I'm working at home what do those things look like so I think you can't escape the kind of uh, the possibility that we're really in a time of massive disruption in terms of the way that we work and our understandings of work and so the frames are really needing to shift in this moment and so I think it's a, it's a very exciting time and there's loads of opportunity for us to really maybe fix them some things that that haven't served uh, people or even kind of the the business outcomes that uh, organizations are kind of trying to lever. Really interesting. I mean, there's a there's a guy, if you've not read his book, Dave Coplin, who's ex-Microsoft actually, wrote a book called Business Reimagined. And it, mm. actually I was reading it around the time that I was working with John at three and it was driving some of my sort of thinking around how we were still treating offices like they were, you know, factory floors where really, everyone was clocking in, clocking out. And that point you made about sort of individual preference is really interesting. I think, you know, Penny, you know, we're starting to touch on that just now, the kind of assumption that everyone will just flip over to, you know, being comfortable with just mostly remote work or mostly going back to the office. And then the other, I guess the other dimension this for me is also clearly the role and the industry that people are in, like mm. you know, car, show, you know, car sales, for example, is going to be very te tethered to the place where you actually show people and actually hand over cars. So there are some sort of, you know, sales roles or perhaps physical goods roles where the physical location you know isn't as flexible as say the knowledge the knowledge worker penny the, the other thing i thought was interesting when we were you know pre prepping for this was the sort of the gender balance thing which i i, I found fascinating because clearly uh, I, I, as a guy i often sort of just see things from from my perspective so I, i'm really interested in sort of you talking about your view on on, on the different yeah sure well and on the the different types of job my daughter is an apprentice hairdresser so where very, very long term, you know, she has a vision of having a family, being able to work from home, have a little kind of salon in her house. That's decades away from her opportunity. She's going to need to be going to a salon for a long time. And, and I do wonder, like Matt said, this is a huge disruption with great opportunities, but I think also some risks and threats. I wonder about how our young people are going to learn to interact with people when their primary way of doing that is all through a video screen right so my kid is out doing a job every day washing people's hair chatting to them in that normal way whereas the apprentices that I have and, and our business has a lot of apprentices we 12 of my consultants have been apprentices I have four current apprentices that they're, they're now used to just meeting people and engaging people through the screen and and another consequence is that a lot of them, one of them just moved house actually at the weekend and I was talking to him about the move and he and his partner had had this tiny little one bed flat and they, they'd rented that place thinking that's fine because all we have to do is sleep there. 
And then suddenly last year, it's the place where they are spending 24 seven, their families are back home in India. So they don't have family to escape to at the weekends or anything. And so they just couldn't wait to move somewhere just with a second bedroom so that they weren't just living their entire lives in one tiny space. And I think there's a lot of people for many reasons who've always had work as an escape. Certainly for me as a single mum and other mums that I know and, and Matt being the, the, the key carer, you might have the same experience. Sometimes going to work is kind of a, an escape. And I don't mean escaping your children necessarily, but I mean escaping that sense. Like when you're working from home, all of those other things that you need to do, they're all around you. Mm. You can't avoid seeing that cup of tea splash on the wall in the hallway or you know the dog nagging you for attention or a walk or those jobs that you need to get done and certainly for me when Lottie was younger working from home was a way of meeting those responsibilities so working from home was always a day of compromise where I'd maybe work shorter hours so that I could be there for her or get other jobs done or was a day when I had to go do something at school or pick her up on time or whatever and and how you manage that is tough and it's it's tough when you're in a happy situation, but when your life at home is difficult, maybe you're in a bad relationship or just going through a bad patch or where you live is a compromise. All of that makes that tougher and tougher. And, you know, I, I do also really feel for parents now because when my child was little, I returned to work when she was three months old. So I had a bit of time off when she was a toddler. She's always known me working. The way I managed that was to be very binary with her. Either mummy was at work or mummy was with Lottie and there was not really that crossover and now people are having to face this experience of compromise and even, I mean she's gonna be 18 in a few weeks and even last year she was saying to me mum spending time with your daughter is more important than work you know like you must come and play with me in the evenings you know and that is that must be really tough especially when your kids are younger. The compartmentalization is really tough actually I mean, like my, my kids are eight and ten and um I'm very lucky. I mean, like, another thing is why I, I like having conversations like this is I know I'm very lucky. And I actually spent spent the first few months of the pandemic feeling very guilty. I was very lucky to have you know, a house in, in a village. I was able to kind of escape you know, the, the Zoom meetings by going for a walk or a bike ride in the countryside very easily. And I've got my own, I think I've got my own floor up here. I've got my own space to, to work. I can shut the door and I can shut away the chaos that was the homeschooling. And my wife's actually a part-time primary school teacher. So she took care of the kids and, you know, I, I was very, very lucky. And I, I did feel very guilty because I knew other people were struggling. I knew other people had their kids in the background on calls and things like that. And I know how, how tough it's been, how, how tough it's been for people. And essentially you talk about risk, because for me, that's been a big thing that I've kind of helped organisations with is as much as kind of understanding where their technology was and what tech they needed to kind of get into different locations and get people kind of laptops and things like that. The other thing that's, that's changed is clear is a lot of the processes have had to change because when you were handling perhaps sensitive data before, there was a degree of physical security that came with being in the office location, like contact centers, for example, a big one. I know from our days at three, John, there was a lot of controls around personal information and so on, because you were in the contact center environment and perhaps you might leave your, your mobile phone locked in the locker or various other things that were kind of like, you know, control measures that prevented data, data breaches or, or privacy uh, issues. And now, of course, the, as you say, Penny, the compartmentalization is kind of gone, right? There's this blurriness between am I working or am I doing something else? And unfortunately, hackers have, have exploited that as well, right? They've they've sent things to people's sort of personal devices, impersonating employers. You know, they've also kind of preyed on the pandemic, unfortunately. And kind of keeping on top of the technology has actually, you know, as, as much as the IT department perhaps has initially been seen as, you know, been very heroic in terms of getting like things like Teams and Zoom and other things established. They've also behind the scenes been dealing with all kinds of nasty stuff because perhaps they're just not equipped to manage all these computers everywhere, um, you know, distributed across the country or, or, or wherever they may be. And I've heard various stories of people having to take, go into their office and take their desktop and monitor home. And that machine was never designed to be anywhere other than in the office, right? And all of a sudden you've got to try and reconfigure and set that machine up at home. So there's a whole bunch of, sort of technology challenges. But this nicely moves on for the last few minutes of our conversation around the technology. Now, clearly, um, things like this, you know, I, I kind of make the joke that it's nice, it'd be nice to meet people in 3D because this two-dimensional two box that we're all kind of stuck in here is, is getting a bit tiring, right? But I think 
what's been really interesting for me is seeing perhaps some of the innovation that's around the corner with you know the, which will make perhaps the mixed uh, workforce uh, more easy to manage where you're able to blend sort of meeting experiences because i remember i think one of the reasons john you said you know earlier the pandemic has really accelerated the adoption of things like teams and zoom and collaboration and i think one of the things that really was a blocker is what we're about to run into which is this mixed scenario and by that i mean when you have a meeting and you have some people dialing in and some people in the room the experience is wildly different, right? If you're in the room or dialed in. And that was obviously really, really bad when people were just dialed in on audio. It's better with a webcam. And it's even better if you've got some very expensive sort of telepresence equipment and, you know, nice screens and Microsoft service devices. But I think it's going to be interesting to see what, um, what Microsoft and some of the others do around making that kind of hybrid work meeting sort of environment better. I mean, some of the features that are coming in Teams that are really, really interesting that will help perhaps lower the barrier to someone who's dialed in and of course, it will be situations where if you're in the office, I mean, I had a call actually with French colleagues the other day. There was two people in a conference room. There was no one else in there. And one of them was dialed in on their laptop with the camera facing them. And the other one had the conference room. So it was, it was fascinating to sort of see a vision of the future almost of a couple of people in the office and everyone else was on Zoom. And it kind of works when it's like that because everyone is, you know, fix, you know, I suppose the common denominator is everyone's on the collaboration tool. I think as soon as it tips to more people in person, in a physical place, all of a sudden, you don't want the clunkiness of the technology slowing down the human interaction. I can see someone's reacting to something because I can see their body language. I can see all those nonverbal cues. So for me, what's going to be really fascinating is how organizations manage this, these meetings where we move to perhaps more people being in the office, some people still being vulnerable or not vaccinated or whatever the situation might be, and not in the office or not comfortable in the office or not their day to be in the office, how that actually works. Something that popped up in our research was people reported quite a lot of frustration with organizations that had multiple technology platforms. So if, you know, you guys being the, the, the tech leaders in this call, um, the problem, I don't know what the solution is, but the problem that we heard people talk about was sometimes I'm using Teams, sometimes I'm using Zoom, sometimes I'm using Slack, sometimes I'm emailing people, sometimes I'm WhatsApping people. And can you just make it easy for me to know how and when, which piece of kit I'm supposed to use and just make it really simple. Now that said, when people's organization did make it really simple, technology just became like a given. It just became a, it was no longer a thing. It, it just it sort of went away. But when it was complicated, it becomes a big headache. It's like old technology. It's great when it works, terrible when it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> But I think was all oh, John, John, you speak for us all there. I was listening to that thinking, oh, my God, I, I spend all day jumping from different type to different type oh. as different customers use different stuff. Every time it kicks out my Bluetooth from my headphones, every oh. single time, John, I know so exactly what you're saying there. One of the conversations that we had in our or one or two of the conversations we had that kind of led to our the formal research was the beauty of something like Zoom is you click a button and it works, right? Typically, if you're just the person receiving the invite, you click in the link and it does what it's supposed to do, right? It's not complicated, it's not flashy, but it just does what it says in the pin. Now, that's not me promoting Zoom. I'm, we're not affiliated with Zoom by any way. It's like, put it out there. As, as a, as a non-informed user of these sorts of platforms my own personal experience is i tend to go with the one that just is simple easy yeah. and what it says so so i'd be really interested to see i mean it's great that organizations are pushing out like microsoft are pushing forward on their their vr stuff that's great and if it's not easy for somebody like me sitting at home in my office in rural northern ireland then you know Hmm, it's probably not going to take on in the same way, but that's where the pandemic, I think, fast forwarded that leap because everybody realized Everyone was forced to, was to forced get to use this yeah. thing. And actually, yeah. it's really simple and it works. Great. The nail on the head why Zoom has been so successful, right? It's just yeah. been so easy for people to use it. I think I was just going to say, I think that there's pros and cons about that because that's really true. It has pushed people to use it. But I also think it's kind of made it the lowest common denominator, because as you say, John, it's about simplicity and accessibility. And I was going to ask uh, Ollie about his experience, but certainly for me, I think there's been 
a bit less of kind of trying new things and being innovative because usually when you're in the office together as kind of technical people like okay I'm a geek um so with fellow geeks I'm like oh I tried this brilliant new whiteboarding technology for making videos last week I've got the first 30 days free look at this video I made and somebody else will go oh yeah I use this other one over here and and so part of what Tanium does is help control uh, the, that technology when you roll it out but where I feel like I'm missing out a bit is on the new experimental things so when we were first using zoom like two and a half years ago it was kind of experimental um, we've had a couple of times where we've needed to do that during the last year and it's definitely not been as fun as grassroots as trying new stuff as it was in the past so for example, because we can't do in-person training of when we roll out Salesforce, we've needed to make it all as videos and we needed to annotate those videos. So do like a Zoom recording, but with instructions on it. And we had to figure out a, a way of doing that. But a, a lot of the kind of new little uh, apps that we might play with, I, I feel there's been a bit less of that. But uh, on the flip side, John, I think you're right. The, the great positive thing is it has engaged a much wider audience with some of these technologies. I think there's a broader point to build on that is the ability to connect with people. But how do I have a kind of a brainstorming session? How do I, in the moment when I've got some great idea, I might have been able to go over to somebody's desk and say, look, have you got five minutes? I'm just thinking about something. Help me just think about it. Um, I can't do that because I need to schedule a session. And then the moment's kind of gone. So I was talking about serendipity area, right? That kind of yeah. serendipitous moments aren't, aren't. So it's kind of like we need something that replicates the ability to kind of bump into people. As much as we perhaps might have found that annoying before, right? You know, oh, I'm just trying to get some work done. And someone comes along and wants to have a coffee chat with me. Uh, actually now, you know, I think a lot of us are, are, are really pulling that back, right? So, I mean, I think it's interesting. Some, some of these platforms do have the ability to kind of see when people are online and sort of then ping them when they are. That's, that's kind of what Zoom's missing, really. It's great for this, for doing these sorts of calls, but it's not so great for the sort of casual sort of, is someone available? Can I just quickly ping them something? Yeah. Um, which perhaps something like Slack or some of the other platforms like Teams are perhaps better at. And it was interesting hearing you say, though, John, about experience. So, that's one of the things that um, in, perhaps in closing, we can kind of talk about. One of the things that um, is really exciting for, for, for Penny and I right now is Tanium and Salesforce have, have, a, have, have come together and, and, and launched something all around the kind of employee experience, actually. So I, it's been pretty frustrating for people, I think, you know, throughout the pandemic when they've had the technology go wrong, because before they perhaps could just walk up to the IT help desk department and go, right, my laptop's broken. Can you just fix it? Right? Yeah. Now, the problem, of course, is, you can't just go into the office or if, if, you, if you did, there probably wouldn't be the IT person wouldn't be there. So how do you kind of replicate the ability to kind of get things sorted out easily and quickly? And so one of the things that the you know, Tanium and um, Telesforce have been working on for the last few months is how do we take the really clever technology that Tanium is that gives um, companies insight on the security level and also systems management level? How do you find out that information? How do you package it up really easily so that the person that's dealing with the IT help desk can not only see that perhaps Penny's Bluetooth headset keeps dropping out, but can also see all the data, you know, appropriate uh, uh, amount of data. It's not private data, it's the system information, and perhaps about the events on that machine. So they can go and straight away go and find out the source of the problem. You know, perhaps it's that Penny's laptop's not got much memory or, or, or is overloaded, you know, it's too busy, whatever it might be. So that's you know, at the heart. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's at the heart of the proposition, really, is the ability to kind of get really good visibility into what's actually going on, regardless of where the computer is in the world, and then be able to take action on it. So they actually better go and push out changes and updates. And so that's kind of, you know, for me, I think that's, that's vital because the reliance, I think a lot of IT departments had for a long time was on being in the office. There was so much dependency on being in the office and it's kind of natural, right? It's an extension of what we talked about earlier. The office is kind of like the extension of the factory. And there was this assumption that everyone would just go there. And a lot of IT teams have had this assumption that at some point the laptop or you know, the device will go into the office building. And at that point, right, great, we've seen the device, we'll update it for security and all this sort of stuff. And all that sort of model now needs to kind of be blown, blown away really. And um, if you don't uh, catch up, the employee experience suffers. So people's devices are, are slower or have issues. And also fundamentally, they're also less secure because they're not being kept up to date. So um, you know, for me, there's a bunch of challenges that the mixed workforce presents from a security and technology sort of standpoint which um, I think a lot of organizations are gonna to need to face into because perhaps right now they've been able to flip into a remote, you know, remote only mode. 
but fairly soon they're going to have to deal with a situation where some people are in the office, some people are going in and out of the office, you know, how are we going to keep on top of all of that? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's certainly something that's going to be really interesting to see how, how it plays out, as well as, as I say, how you get the collaboration and connection to work. So um, Matt, I'm thinking else you would add from a technology angle. Is there anything that you think technology needs to do? Maybe just to kind of bounce in a few thoughts. Mm. Uh, I read this morning on uh, Medium from a guy called uh, Brandon Hamber talking about the kind of new normal and some of the kind of issues that we're facing in this moment. And he said that there's no new normal. It's all profoundly abnormal. <laughs> and many are confusing enforced haphazard adaptation with normalization. Interesting. And so I think we're in this kind of total moment of flux in terms of how are the kind of uh, pieces going to fall here? Uh, in terms of what it means for us to kind of uh, find our place uh, into the work and what that will look like um, kind of tomorrow. And I think there's this idea of the our environment um, that we kind of are, are talking about here. How will this be arranged? The technology, the process, the, the people, uh, and picking up the kind of one of your earlier videos where you brought in purpose to that kind of as a, as a bottom line there, kind of what is it that we're actually trying to do and has that significantly changed? Uh, in this moment and then the flip of that kind of environmental side is uh, we are seeing things a little bit is the role that we all play as individuals in terms of being clear how we uh, are coming to our work and uh, where we want to lo locate ourselves into that and maybe one of the things that we offer is we'll pilot or prototype a thing because mm. that's within our kind of gift or interest uh, to do that and so I think there's a real thing around ways of working that there's an opportunity for us to kind of rethink how we engage uh, staff or employees in the workplace so that we're actually making the kinds of predict progression or we're exploring kind of the creativity that I think that I'm hearing Penny talk about that we need to see if we're going to continue to grow and develop what it is that we're doing and how we're doing it. So, uh, I mean, I'm probably typically optimistic um, but I really believe that there's a, there's kind of lots of really exciting opportunity here. Uh, and certainly there's a need for new competencies around mm. how do we do this? And I think as Penny mentions, and certainly as I kind of engage with my kids, uh, I'm conscious of is there also this kind of a recession of skills that we, we need to kind of watch that we don't lose too. But certainly kind of helping staff work through what are the new competencies that we are when we're working in this blended or hybrid context, I think has got to be something essential. And to miss out on that, I think then we'll, we'll end up with fracture or kind of miscommunication or breakdown that were we to get those things right. Um, maybe we wouldn't need to experience some of those negatives. And so it's really a moment, I think, as you mentioned earlier on in the conversation, uh, Ollie, to get the leadership bit right and to be actually kind of putting our people to work in the key areas of our businesses so that we're aligning things to that kind of big purpose or strategic direction kind of in this key moment of change. Thanks, Matt. That's that, uh, a re really nice, concise way of sort of summarising where we're at. So, John, we've, we've spoken a lot about this report. Um, where can folks uh, get hold of a copy if they'd like to if they'd like to see it for themselves? Well, two places. Uh, they can find us on LinkedIn. Uh, just look for Airmed and find us. You can also get us on airmed.co.uk. We're going to be uh, pushing out some more information in the coming weeks, hopefully, around well, what what's the implication of all of this research for me as an individual? I may or may not have the luxury of determining where I do my best work. I might do my best work in the office. I might do my best work at home. That's fine. But somebody might tell me, regardless, you are going to be here <laughs> in the office on these dates. And then regardless of whether you like it or not, you're going to be at home working on these dates. Okay. So how can I understand in those two different environments, how can I personally get the best from me. We talk about boundaries. How do people create boundaries when they're at mm. home? Penny, you talked about the challenges of being a single mother. Like how do you create the boundaries needed to be effective at work? What does that mean then whenever you go into the office? The, all of these challenges, not a look back about what we've seen, but more about a proposition of how we move forward um, into this new world of work. Uh, and that's uh, a tool that we're going to be pushing out um, before the end of this month. We can confidently say that, Matt, can't we? We can say it confidently by the end of the month. Absolutely, John. Great.
just need the technology to work, right? <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Well, look, I can include links uh, to, to those um, to, to those things uh, in the description of this video as well. So. Um, well, look, thank, thank you all, all for your time. It's been a great conversation. I'm really pleased. Uh, I always like it when we get different perspectives together because you, you, know, you bounce around some, some interesting thoughts. So uh, thanks so much, everybody. It's been great. Brilliant. Good. Thank, thank you, Oliver. Thanks for inviting me. It's loads of fun. Thanks. Yes. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Great to meet you guys. Bye.